let's start. Uh, the first uh, panelist to give uh, a brief introduction is uh, Luke Tan. Luke Tan is uh, the CEO of uh, Techco uh, USA, uh, doing uh, innovation, entrepreneur, and acceleration program in USA. So, come on, give us a brief. Great to be here. Um, my topic today is a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, toward convergence, AI, IoT, and blockchain. And this is something we started thinking about uh, two years ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know, TechCode is uh, a global accelerator program in seven countries, 25 different cities. We are the first AI thing accelerator in the US, starting from three years ago. Uh, one thing that uh, we, we help many of these uh, AI startups to make their IoT devices smarter by using machine learning and AI techniques. But one of the challenges we have encountered seems like an insurmountable barrier for these startups to be successful is the data availability problem. How can a startup get the high quality data for them to train and they improve their algorithm? And the, the world's data is either in the hands of a few big enterprises or they're in a data silo. Until last year, we met a, a few blockchain startups, very ambitious uh, talents, and they come to us uh, with uh, an ambitious solution that it seems to me like a very ideal solution uh, for this problem. So blockchain has some very unique properties immutable mechanism, tokenized consensus, privacy, trust, decentralized, etc. And with these properties, and so you make the IoT devices more secure, the participants more incentivized to share the data and more trustworthy. And so think about it. You can build a marketplace or to encourage open exchange of data across different machines and IoT devices and to break down the data silos I just mentioned about. And uh, you can also even do decentralized machine learning and when the startups, uh, when, when the devices can upload their data and directly do it. So data is at the core of this convergence and we describe them roughly in three different layers. One is the distribution layer that collects transport data and then the second is process layer and that process is analyzed third is blockchain, and that government that ultimately secures and transacts data. In IoT, we have uh, seen billions of connections. Um, we always talk about uh, the, the big potential uh, of IoT. But one thing that's less discussed is uh, how little of this data generally is actually utilized. Uh, one study by McKinsey shows it's uh, about 1%. And that's because no real trust, no means of insecurity for sharing of this data. And as a, at the processing layer, and uh, AI is becoming a core part of any blockchain application, the apps. The smart contract is used, um, it is used to automate transactions and actions when you trigger some conditions. But now they are very simple, and they cannot handle uh, the legal languages. Very natural, you can use contextual deep learning, natural language processing to improve that. A another pain point is uh, these uh, blockchain applications are easy to have uh, loopholes to be attacked by hackers. And you can use reinforcement learning to simulate these attacks to improve that. And uh, at the governance layer, blockchain provides promising systems to authenticate, secure, and transact data. Particularly in transaction, the token, they have something called token economics and to provide incentives for data sharing, to build communities, to encourage network effects. So these are the opportunities at each intersection. So if we look at uh, in more detail, uh, this, is, uh, this page is uh, based on um, a graph produced by Outlier Ventures 
from looking from the left to the right side, and we see the data flow from the data collection, uh, authentication, translocation, text, etc. Um, you will see there are many different uh, investment opportunities uh, across this network, but not with the Uh, this is one of the convergence example, and uh, one of our portfolio startup called SkillChain that use IoT sensors uh, to collect the data, and using AI for predictive uh, procurement and manufacture, and use blockchain to promote collaboration across the supply chain. So TechCode has uh, helped many startups uh, uh, that focus on this area. Uh, we can look at. Uh, Context grid in the area of AR, peculiar chain, personal data exchange, Crowsy or AI based marketplace, and Creo Vision, the computer vision startup. So many of the startups are supported uh, by big companies we work with. So the big companies we work with are uh, startups uh, to gain access to the newest technologies and applications. And for startups, it's also a really need that is accelerated growth in this area. And we have uh, recently launched our accelerator program in AI and blockchain. And I would like to invite all of you to join us to build together the future of IoT economy. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Very exciting. Uh, so I'm going to move to the uh, next uh, panelist, Jo. Uh, she is the CEO of a autonomous drive company called AutoX. All right. Hello, um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I think among uh, people in the semiconductor industry, I am probably one of the outliers here because we are very upper level. We do the algorithms and AI of autonomous driving. And uh, I want to share with you what our company is creating. We want to democratize autonomy. And exactly what we mean by that is we want to make the, for the world's first LBSS platform. That is location-based self-driving service platform. You already have a lot of location-based services today, like your Uber, your Lyft, uh, your Meituan, right? All the O2O services. And we believe that um, it's like the computers of old times. It's bigger than this room. It benefits no one, okay? It's only benefiting the society when it's small. It's affordable and it's uh, in mass production. That's what we try to do at Autorex, to bring the self-driving car technology to everyone. And we have, um, our platform right now have three vehicles. The first one is a typical um, human-drove car that's from uh, Ford, that's a Lincoln. We call it Express. The second one is a Mini. It's smaller. It goes in a lower speed, and it's very benign, okay? The third one is what we call Max. That is of the size of a minivan, and I'll uh, introduce each of those. This is the Express. Uh, when it's for a robo-taxi or ride-sharing, this is the look that we give it. But when it's for grocery delivery or delivering your food from restaurant, uh, we paint it green so that you know things are kept fresh. Here is, um, we have been testing in California for a year and a half um, without any accidents so far. Um, this is a video showing our testing. In the video, we're just constantly making left turns, which is supposed to be the most difficult in autonomous driving. We not only test in daytime, we also test at night vigorously. This is a joint testing with SAIC. Uh, for those uh, who know them, SAIC is Shanghai Automotive. They are one of the largest uh, OEMs in the whole world. Basically like the Ford of China. Okay, second vehicle is this Mini. It's a low speed delivery cart. It's as wide as a human being. When it opens up, it's as big as your trunk. Okay, it goes in a lower speed. And this is uh, the Mini in reality. It's cute as a button. We test it in uh, US as well. And here is a test demo video that we, we want to share with you. And it shows how we design our systems, okay? 
um, there is an evil pedestrian that cover up the 16 beam LiDAR on top of the vehicle. <laughs> so <laughs> now he's our employee. <laughs> so the car is driving only with the cameras right now at night. And it can deal with four-way stop signs. It can deal with um, bicyclists, pedestrians, all kinds of emergent road situations. Here is also our employee. We pay for their insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I test this car myself all the time. So even if you know I, I jump at a very close range, and by law of physics, you cannot stop, it still doesn't hurt. So this is the most benign autonomous driving product that we can think of. It's to show that our primary sensor are cameras. But we want to have multiple layers of redundancy. So if cameras fail, we fall back on LIDARs. If LIDAR fail, we also have ultrasonics and all the other sensors. But that's all, only redundancy on the perception level. You also need redundancy on the algorithms, meaning you never make a single decision based on a single algorithm. After that, you have redundancy on the computer. What if your computer crash? And it happens a lot in Waymo's test driving. If you look at their test report, most of the human takeovers are because of uh, the computer crash. So we have a secondary um, computer, a smaller one, that constantly monitor the main computer, send a signal asking, are you alive, are you alive, every few seconds, uh, milliseconds. And if the main computer is dead, the, um, the watcher kicks in and take control to fully stop the vehicle. The last one is the MAX. Uh, MAX is, uh, we're making it right now. We have a prototype that does not look as pretty as this one, but <laughs> we're getting there. Okay. So these are the three vehicles. Um, in general, we want to do robot as a service. We also do the HD 3D mapping by ourselves, and uh, we provide a smart scheduling, and uh, that is working towards the goal of a smart city. And from now on, it's more technical. We have a lot of inventions in-house at AutoX, but we want to emphasize on four of them. The first one is camera-first perception. What we mean by camera-first, like I mentioned, camera is the first primary sensor for our system. The reason why we choose that, we also do sensor fusion. It's not camera only, it's camera first. The reason why we do that is, one, we want this technology to be affordable, okay? So when it comes to mass production, uh, cameras are the cheapest and also most reliable. And we also care about resolution. The highest resolution LiDAR has only 128 points currently that is available in the market. So when a pedestrian is 50 meters away, you only see a few dots on the pedestrian body. You don't know what you're looking at. We believe to have a safe autonomous driving system, the cameras has to be fully exploited. And here we're doing a comparison. The left three, the blue one, is a depth map from cameras that we built. The red one is the 3D point cloud that we built from cameras. We're comparing against 16 beam LiDAR from Velodyne and also a flash LiDAR that cannot even see the trees behind. Okay, so the camera, camera 3D point cloud are the highest resolution and can see the furthest. We also do a lot of side views with cameras because of the Tesla uh, incident, because Tesla only can recognize cars from the front and back. They don't see other angles. This is driving in downtown San Francisco, is to show you that when you are driving in an urban scenario, there are so many things, okay? Using LiDAR, you don't have enough resolution for to achieve level four or level five full autonomy. Thank you. <laughs> we also... We also do large-scale HD 3D mapping. That is a number one question uh, when you want to scale up. But right now, a lot of autonomous driving companies can do mapping, but they only do a small loop because they don't have this capability. We do it with our uh, fused sensor rack. On the top, it's a LiDAR. It's a 40-beam LiDAR. For those who are familiar with who produce 40-beam LiDAR, you probably already know who that is. And then we have a surrounding cameras, eight of them. Those are fused together, and this is the map that we built. <coughs> the points are from LiDAR points. The color are from cameras. Mm. This is just around our office. Okay. 
We also built our own uh, 3D simulator, which I know only a few companies in the world have this to fully test their autonomous driving system. We not only visualize what it looks like for the system, we also mimic the LiDAR scan as well as the whole HD 3D map so that our entire autonomous driving system is tested in simulation. Uh, from what I know, Waymo only have a 2D simulator. Therefore, um, they are not testing their whole system in the simulation. Okay, this is the uh, maps from the simulator. Okay, the last one we want to emphasize is we do hardware and software integration. You guys are the hardware people. You know how important this is. Um, we do our own integrated design. We do PCB boarding, and uh, we also do the drive-by-wire because we think that's um, one of the important things for safety. This is just me taking videos. <laughs> this is our team. It's a little bit old. We have around 80 people now going to be 100 very soon. We are 10 minutes away from this location. <laughs> All right, and um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so you see that difference? The software guy's PPT is way better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our next panelist is Chris. Chris is a veteran in computing, and he's going to present this new architecture for AI. Thank you. Computing is a uh, semiconductor and systems company, uh, and now an IP company. We're headquartered in California, here in Campbell. Uh, we are building systems for accelerating the inferencing and training of AI neural networks using a data flow technology that we have developed. Okay, so today's hardware systems for uh, machine learning, uh, GPUs and FPGAs, were originally designed for other applications. For example, GPUs were designed for uh, graphics acceleration, and uh, FPGAs were designed for RTL emulation. But with the uh, massive increase in AI, and deployment of AI, there was a call for a new set of architectures, and there are a number of startups, including Web Computing, that are proposing new architectures. Ours is based on uh, data flow computing. Machine learning training requires massive data sets, uh, it's a very complex um, uh, process for training and tuning and doing parameter, hyperparameter tuning of neural networks. It takes time. The people that do it cost a lot of money. So we actually want uh, systems that can train neural networks very quickly. And training systems can actually take days or even weeks. Uh, so there's this uh, need for massive compute acceleration. And we we claim that uh, data f deep learning is actually a data flow operation. So the flow in TensorFlow, for example, is data flow. And we, uh, we believe that data flow applications are best executed on a data flow computer. And that is what we have designed. So we're revolutionizing the performance and efficiency of deep learning systems. Uh, we've created the industry's first AI native data flow system. Uh, we've uh, started shipping that to our early access customers just this month. Uh, our beta releases will be shipping uh, in a couple of months' time, and we will be doing a general uh, release of our systems product uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, we're packing about 10 to 20 times the performance of current CPU, GPU type systems uh, in this system. And going forward, we <coughs> believe uh, that AI is going to move to the edge not only for inferencing, but also for training. Mm -hmm. And we have recently announced that we've acquired MIPS Technologies. MIPS uh, is a leading CPU provider of uh, processes <coughs> for edge applications. And we are now building with them a roadmap which we will be announcing over the next couple of months uh, for AI-infused solutions with a single architecture of both hardware and software, supporting real-time <coughs> AI with low latency, low batch size inferencing, uh, and also, it will be reconfigurable. So everything that we are doing is using a reconfigurable architecture, primarily because the algorithms are changing every month. <coughs> there's new innovation coming out of companies uh, uh, and PhD students and so forth. And so I'm noticing that it takes uh, 
Whereas it used to take 10 years to get a, an algorithm from, uh, from, say, ICCP into deployment, we now actually need that into a range of a few months. And so reconfigurable computing is the approach that we're using for this. And we are working from edge to the data center. We've developed a chip. Uh, it's uh, over the last three years. It's um, an AI native processor specifically for deep learning. Uh, it contains 16,000 processors uh, with 8,000 arithmetic units. It runs at 6 gigahertz. Uh, it's in a 16 pin fit technology. It delivers about 10 to 20 times the performance of GPUs, specifically for low latency type applications. Uh, and when we put it into a system, you don't need a CPU. So it runs completely autonomously without the CPU. And that's what actually gives us our big performance advantage because we're not basing this on heterogeneous architecture when we, put, when we build a system. The top left there is our first system. It's a, a, a system that goes into enterprise, uh, uh, enterprise systems. And uh, then we're following that up with this data center system. And as I mentioned before, we'll be putting out the roadmap edge based. Thank you, thank you, Chris. All right. So we have actually added technology, uh, blockchain from uh, Luke. So now we look at all the technology we discussed here: IoT, cloud, AI, autonomous driving, and blockchain. I'd like to pose a question to each of you and to get more insight of this technology. Maybe start with, the, with, with Chris. Okay. So um, I think the semiconductor have a lot of new in disruptors, with the Amazons and Googles and you know, Alibaba's and Jimmy. And how is these companies going to drive the direction of semiconductor, particularly in the AI? Well, uh, only five years ago, the semiconductor industry was in a bit of a slump in terms of innovation and funding for innovation, in my opinion. Uh, it was very difficult to actually get companies and semiconductor fund companies funded. I actually believe that it's, I, that it's AI, actually, that it's AI that has actually brought the industry out of that slump uh, and is actually driving the growth uh, going forward. And I've, you know, a lot of the plenary talks uh, are really sort of pointing in that direction. And... Um, so I see that that's where the drive is coming from, the deployment of AI-based systems, not only in the cloud, but also in the edge of network type systems, like ADAS systems. All right, so you're all in AI. All in AI. All right. So the second question is to Naveen. I think your presentation shows something that really resonates very well to, to me, because as an EA guy, I look at the growth is how many people, how many seats, how many designers are out there doing doing the designs? So with all the new technology we talk about, the design activities so far is still very limited to like four, five, maybe six regions of the world. What's your view in terms of making more people jumping as a designer? I think uh, when there is a success out there, we should try to copy it. I believe uh, software systems have shown us how they have gone from you know 10,000 people, 100,000 people to several million people now in that industry. So I think we should shamelessly copy their success model. The way they have done that is that they have invested in building these vertical stacks and reduce the complexity of designing a minimum viable product. I think we have to do the same thing. So somehow based on open source, or free IP, or free uh, other components of the system, we have to get to a point where people can build a minimum viable product with very little expertise, mm -hmm. and having a narrow expertise in one or two areas without having an expertise in 14, 15 areas. One, two, such kind of chips should be doable at high school level, just like software is doable at a high school level. So for example, Sci-Fi, Western Digital, and a couple of other companies have gone together, and we are actually done some hackathons at high schools where people are using our system to build some inference engine, very simple kind of thing. Get them interested in AI, get them interested in hardware design, and I think that's the right age we should. So I think this is, Sammy is working very hard on that. 
I think GSA should work on that. All of us should really work to really reach out to the youth, give them something they can do. But it should be that you have to need five PhDs before you can start doing your job. That is ridiculous. And this is the reason why we are left with whatever people we are left with, right? And if that is the way, you know, it's not very welcoming. So my opinion is very simple. Let's make it simple. Simple chip, limited chip. No, you're not going to do the you know most incredible chip, but just something. Start, and then you can build on top of that and start here. This would be my opinion. Okay. Thank you, Navi. We are looking forward to the new ecosystem established over years. Next year. What's the time timeline? Well, uh, we have already announced that. Uh, uh, our uh, solution is available to all high schools uh, and, and universities available worldwide. Uh, from the deployment point of view, we think that by Q1 of next year, it is something we will announce what is called general availability. So, so Q1 next year. All right. So, um, so I'd just like to add to that, that uh, for those PhDs that do design chips that don't need to be a part of this, we really want you to come and work for us. <laughs> we really, we really need some uh, some good PhDs working in AI silicon. <laughs> All right. Okay. My next question is to uh, to Craig. I, I think that we've seen a lot of consolid consolidation in semiconductors. Right? The number of company getting less, even though some of them gets bigger, and with all the you know traditional semiconductor number reducing and new you know disruptors amazon alike coming into business as vertically integrated what do you see the whole train moving forward yeah, i think chris was actually alluding to this a little bit in that it, 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 it was a little bit of doom and gloom for for semis for a while there the, the feeling was that there were going to be four or five large companies and no one else was going to be in the in the business but the, i think what happened is AI and some of these other uh, things could even be uh, subcomponents of blockchain, like the uh, you know the uh, Bitcoin mining and such. They there became specialized applications that run fastest and best at the silicon level, and it reinvigorated interest in doing silicon level uh, optimization. And so I, I think that renewed interest in in uh, chips has helped their. Uh, draw more dollars into semi-design in the last three or four years, and then uh, with these very large companies, uh, the likes of, of Amazon and others, have decided that they need to be in the chip business, and so they they vertically integrated, and they have begun to do their own chips, which means they need uh, expertise that they didn't previously have, but they they themselves are driving some of those designs. So from a design perspective, I think there, there's actually been a, a lot more activity than anyone anticipated five years ago. Yeah. I actually predict a very bright future for EDA. And, I, and, and the reason for that, I think uh, with the bold move that Cadence and others are moving in the cloud, what would that happen is that it's, uh, once the whole design moves to the cloud, you're no longer stuck to the geographical locality of the design itself. And so it would be possible, and I keep on talking about these two guys sitting in a village in Brazil doing a chip. So okay, once they start doing it, then you know, the, I'll be successful. But I think we have to reach out to these people who are all over the world, have ideas, and be able to uh, do these chips and systems, but physically right now they cannot do anything about it. I think cloud is going to, in my view, multiply the revenue of EDA and IP companies by a big number because the design will open up, which in my view was in the last 30 years was stuck into this big five regions of the world. Thank you, Navi. I think that is. Yeah, I just want to make a, a quick comment. Uh, I was in the EDA industry for many years. I always thought the business model for EDA is very elegant. You have no inventory, you have no uh, a big supply chain, right? So, so, and, and this margin is a tremendous, right? It's 90, more than 90 percent new gross margin. So, I do, I do think that uh, the, the the future, right, for IC design is changing. I, I believe that uh, the VCAD, you know, great talk about e, the VCAD. I was part of that, you know, when I was a cadence before, and now I do see the cloud 
uh, computing or the cloud enabled or the AI enabled, uh, you know, uh, this putting EDS off on the cloud uh, will provide the access of design community to many, many people, right? And that will be very powerful, right? So we'll see how, how it works. I think the jury is still out. Uh, so as a, an amazing a revolutionary idea of putting the design capability to many uh, people who cannot afford, you know, the design, right? Cannot do a big design or doesn't have the knowledge of, uh, you know, doing electronic design, right? So this, this is very interesting time. Uh, this is a very interesting time, especially for the 1600 of so, uh, you know, fabulous companies in China. You know, how do they access, you know, the design tools, the IPs, right, to make the company successful? So, so I, I do think this is very interesting. Uh, just want to make a comment. So the thing that I talked about is not the future. We are doing it today. Last month in our company, we taped out four chips on the same day. Just to prove the point that we can tape out four complex chips on the same day. And none of the chips were by us by four of our customers. Okay, so so I just want to make the point that it seems like it is far away and things like that. But right now we are not doing general uh, release. It is beta release to our certain customers. But we just want to make sure that, you know, in any tape out company, I've done around 320, 25 tape outs in my life. I have never done more than one tape out ever in a single week. It's very scary. And we just did four of them on the same day just to prove the point that such scale is possible, such infrastructure exists, and it is possible to do that. So in future, we expect hundreds of chips to be done on the same day, because people are working in parallel on the cloud, you know, none of the sci-fi cloud, you know, uh, customer, you know, engineers are working with them. They are working by themselves using our automation systems. All right, still we are in the cloud. So, so Mong, since you are expert on China, and with all these potential trade wars between, you know, uh, US and China, is the cloud still open? Can we still share through the cloud? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a very, uh, uh, you know, hot topic. You know, you see the news, you know, every day as a headline. There's a new statement from the President of the United States. There's a counter uh, statement coming from China, also the EU, everybody's jumping into it. I, I think, uh, we want to you know, keep politics out of here, right? We're talking about technology. What I like to emphasize is really uh, what we stand for, right? The, the free trade, and I believe globalization is a trend. Any country or any region try to uh, you know, just do things within their region and block out the other regions, I don't think it's, gonna, it's not going to work, right? And also I believe in the open market. Right, and this is this is where we are. Uh, for example, I talk uh, in, in my in my in my speech. The assembly and test companies are all in Asia these days, right? And also the for the fabric guys in in, uh, in in US, the all these giants, the fabrication is mostly done. Well, well for the TSMC customer, right? They own more than for the advanced nodes, right? It's only the, the TSMC. So this is already a global industry. So this open market is very important. And also the IP protection. And I think all these uh, you know, innovation would not happen without the reward that comes with it when the innovation becomes a real product. So it's important that every, everyone, you know, every country, every region, every company do the best to protect the IP that's created by the brains, the talents, you know, or people in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, right? And then, and then lastly, I would think the win-win collaboration is still the way of moving this industry forward. Competition is the norm, right? Without competition, company will not, you know, will not move forward, right? But there are ways that people can collaborate across, you know, the vertical, the vertical supply chain, right? Or the horizontal, even within different, uh, a company in the same domain, they can also collaborate, also within the region, right? So we don't know what's gonna happen, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of uncertainties in the future, 
But I still do believe that uh, the industry as we move forward, uh, we should embrace these ideas that we just talked about. All right. And Silicon Valley still is the center of innovation. Not just for semiconductors, it's for all the new stuff. Right? All the new innovation comes from here. So we're very fortunate to be here. Although I'm based in Shanghai, but my family is still in Silicon Valley. I travel you know, between these two places. I feel very fortunate. Thank you. Thank you, Lon. I, I felt the vibe in China when I brought the task bus delegation to China. And one thing we found out is that among all the startups and the innovations, autonomous drive is by far you know, one of the, the hottest topic. So I'd like to switch to Joe to ask a question I always in my mind is all the companies I have in touch, none of them making money. Okay. So they are, they are burning VCs. <laughs> They're money. raising a lot. But... And uh, I, I like to ask a question: Is uh, your point of view? Who is going to be the first? Yeah. It makes you know make some money, make first profit. That's a good question. When I see autonomous driving, I don't think it's a company. It's actually an industry. It's like the internet in 1995. So there are a lot of verticals that um, different companies are focusing on. Uh, let's talk about the big guys. Waymo is doing robo taxi basically a driverless Uber. I think the market is huge, and the question is, it's coming, but when? Mm -hmm. And uh, my personal opinion is probably 10 years because of all the um, extreme uh, standards that human drivers, human passengers are going to post, including comfort, okay? And uh, the second type of people are working with OEMs, car manufacturers. Those are the ADAS companies. So. Uh, you are actually selling the actual product to the consumer, but you're not there yet. So what can you do? You do assisted driving and uh, only do a few stuff uh, like lane keeping or uh, ACC, adaptive cruise control. And the third type, um, we look at the market um, diligently <laughs> and we think hard. Um, I think the second most frequent application is actually um, delivery. It's a broad sense of delivery. It's not only delivering your UPS FedEx package, it's your Grubhub, your Meituan, uh, your, your Yonghui, your uh, groceries every single day. Uh, the highest frequency is probably RoboTaxi. You probably need it three to five times a day. Second largest is food, three times a day. Can't miss a single one, okay? Third one is your grocery, once a day in China, in US, maybe twice a week or once a week. So this is a high, big enough market, but the requirement to take off is a lot smaller. You can start small. You can say, I can only do autonomous driving on that road. Okay, fixed route, that's all I can do. You can still run a small business. You can have a program running out, but you can't really say that for robo taxi. Uh, you won't make much money. People have all different desires. I want to go here, I want to go there and they're impatient. They're not happy to make that right turn, right turn, right turn, right turn. They want to make left turn, okay, <laughs> unprotected. So, so back to your mini, which is yeah. exactly the one that most likely close to the first dollar. What do I expect? Two years, three years? It can be faster than that. But if you're talking about large scale, yes, two years or three years is probably it. All right, yeah. two years. <laughs> Quote me on it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will. Okay. I think uh, Luke has been. Uh, well, one thing that Luke uh, mentioned here, I think in one of the presentations we're showing here, is with all the venture capital invested in AIs and autonomous driving and all the things, didn't you guys notice the majority of money in the investment is coming from the bigger companies, not from venture capitalists? Right? And uh, I think Luke has been running this acceleration program connecting bigger companies to the startups and how to channel this uh, investment and probably application expertise to the wider community of startups and be able to accelerate their success. So look, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about this? Sure, uh, I, I think I have, before that I just want to add to the uh, Joel's um, uh, comment about self-driving. I think in the future there will be a lot of uh, money-making opportunity for uh, digital services based on the ADAS and the self-driving cars. Blockchain can actually enable that uh, for you.
for, uh, in the future for optimum operation of these cars, and they need information from other cars about traffic. Uh, they need information about the weather and uh, uh, other information. So you can sell, the, uh, you can buy those information on the blockchain uh, with tokens. And uh, in return, you can also sell uh, information to other cars, like the road conditions to smart, uh, to smart city providers, uh, traffic condition to other cars. So you can imagine there are lots of things that can be done uh, with uh, self-driving cars. Coming back to the to the question, um, a tech code is unique that we run our accelerator programs, not only facing the small startups, but also the big companies, because that's where we think that will accelerate the adoption and also the success of the startups, uh, both by providing uh, technology roadmap, product uh, uh, collaborations, and uh, investment. Uh, so um, there are a few different needs from these big companies. Number one is um, uh, they, they want us, uh, one startup to be part of the ecosystem. For example, we work with NVIDIA and Intel on our AI accelerator. Uh, they want to, uh, startup to be able to use their hardware software systems. Uh, number two need is uh, uh, they want to be able to work closely for technology partnerships. Uh, uh, so Samsung is interesting in, in that. And number three is the investment acquisitions where they can put money into across different stages. So to address these needs, we have a, a different tier of uh, services. Number one, for example, you get access to the ecosystem and attending some of our events um, and programs. Number two is more in-depth involvement where we can help these big companies to recruit the startups of their interest and um, ideally in a very specific area. So therefore, be able to help them. Thank you, Luke. I think given the interest of time, I'll open the floor for Q&A uh, for the next five minutes. So, any question? So there were several questions there. Right. One is the availability of talent. Um, and I mean, in, indeed, in, in China, there is, a, there is a massive growth in this area. And I think that China is um, certainly leading uh, in the creation of talent for this, for this space. Um, and we're working with some large Chinese companies, particularly in this area. And I think that um, initially, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the field of the people that have the new PhDs in this area and, and um, they walk around like rock stars at AI conferences. And I think it's actually fantastic. It's all us old people sitting around building chips. But uh, it's, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's uh, just thrilling. Going forward though, um, uh, the, I guess the second part of your question was, was about um, the yeah. frameworks. These right. things, yeah. TensorFlow yeah. and Keras and all that. Exactly, yeah. and related to that, yeah. if you look at the, uh, the IT industry, right? Yep. Yeah. Because we, we, we simplify it, we make it like very long. You don't have to know all the details, right? All you have to do is just know how to, you know, you have logic design and so on, the you know, architecture, and you can use it. And oh, I think, if, look, I know this is a semiconductor forum, but I, I, would, I would argue that lots of people think that's the problem. There's, there's, when you think of the number of people that can program Verilog, Verilog compared to the number of people that program Java, yeah. Python, right. C, right. these things, that's actually the market that you want to go for. And as Navid's saying, you, know, you want to get those people designing chips and innovating into, into silicon very quickly. And that's a, that's, that's a great opportunity. I think that in AI, um, sure, there is these machine workflows, 
Uh, you have MixNet from Amazon, you have TensorFlow, you have Keras, you have CNTK, you have Cafe, and all of those. But most, you'll find that anyone building an AI accelerator is targeting all of those and has to. Absolutely has to. Yes, you have to support all of those. You can't just select one and do your own thing. Uh, that didn't really work that well for Nirvana. If you don't have time or enough engineers to focus on all of them, I would say go with TensorFlow. <laughs> <laughs> because it needs a large enough community to support this. It also needs a lot of solid engineering to keep fixing the bugs. It was not free. So go with Google. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, Google actually has a platform on top of TensorFlow called Keras which is a much easier to use, it's an API for TensorFlow, and it's actually quite straightforward to use. And we, with a lot of our customers that are new to AI, we actually find that working with them on Keras and these, these types of platforms is actually, uh, makes it a lot easier for them, so it's a lower barrier to entry. You don't need to I brought up the grandma, is usually any opportunity to, to, uh, to encapsulate the difficult part of the abstract, so that you don't need a PhD to get into you don't need a PhD to get into the AI space. You can go to Stanford now uh, and, and, and do a summer course on TensorFlow, and it's filled with high school students. All right, thank you. Any any other questions on the floor? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Designing the chip. Oh, sorry. What will you uh, I'm not going to ask questions on uh, designing the chip. Okay? Um, I'm interested in... Uh, uh, opinion, especially from Dr. Joel Lee, uh, about uh, taxi drones or delivery drones. Okay. I mean, that's uh, from my point of view, of course, uh, you know, uh, limited understanding about autonomy. Uh, that's also uh, yet another manifestation of autonomy. Uh, does your industry, which is I mean, uh, uh, you know, driverless cars, uh, have uh, any? Uh, Perspectives about this uh, delivery drones, and a lot of uh, uh, big brand names have already explored that. And I've seen one taxi drone being demoed. <laughs> so that's besides the point. Yeah, good question. Um, I think JD Jingdong is doing that. Also, uh, Shenfeng and Amazon are all doing that. Um, I think for urban scenario, uh, drones are not possible. There are many wires over our head. There are birds, they're flying at very high speed. If they crash with your drone and that heavy stuff fall on any of our head, we're dead. <laughs> um, I would not vote for drones to fly over my head <laughs> if I have the right to. But it's great in suburban and uh, you know military areas. Um, I think China is using them, you know, you can use them on Tibet air, there's no residents whatsoever, there's only sheep there. So yeah, that's that's a good application. It will be there, it's just different application. Thank you. All right, any uh, any other question from the floor? Yeah. Okay. yeah uh, can you stand up and just speak louder? Yeah. I had a question for Jewel. Uh, you talk about, uh, uh, I'll just keep this. <laughs> you, know, you talk about uh, autonomous taxis. That implies that you have a large enough database that you can literally go anywhere you want to. Now, you talk about many verticals that people can get in one area or the other, but at the back end, there needs to be a standardized library of object that any autonomous vehicle can use. You think we're going to get in that direction or are we going to go to Google to get their library or to Apple to get their library? That's a, a nice idea. Um, I think Baidu Apollo is just building that. They are trading HD3D Max and also image data uh, or se sensor data in general. Uh, that's one of their business revenue stream. Um, you um, give Apollo contribute one, they give you three. I think that's the, that's the business idea. 
um, I think it's good unless everyone uses the same code base. So it's a little bit difficult to share between us and Waymo. Our sensor configs are completely different. That's why the Apollo family can do that. Okay, I think it's a, it's a wonderful idea. Um, it's not happening yet, but it will be good for the society. You think uh, people like SAE or IEEE can come up with a standard? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Question is the standard body gonna jump in and try to create it? Oh. <laughs> I, I prefer freedom. <laughs> yeah. okay. it's, it's like the car industry. Everyone make their own cars. There's not really a standard. It's just the industry consensus. So on one side, you prefer freedom. On the other side, you say we should go to Google. But I <laughs> <laughs> Different cases. I own no Google stock, and I have no policy on anything we of Google. I think when they, uh, at the beginning of any new mega train, new technology, it's always felt like a wild, wild west. Everybody's gonna be, uh, find their own way, but when it gets mature, gets standardized, I think we lose a lot of fun. So, let's keep at it is. Last question. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a question for the panel. Um, I work in consumer electronic industry, and my company source chips for Broadcom, Qualcomm, and the, those company. company. But recently, um, our data shows that the market for hardware product is saturated. That's why our management they try to invest more and more in uh, the software side. So the companies basically try to transit from hardware centric to software centric. But I'm just wondering, besides um, taking more software into the company, is there any other breakthrough we can make on the hardware? It's a tough question, but I, 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 I heard that when I was in Shanghai, the new concept was that all, all hardware should be software-defined hardware, yes. right? So I guess software is still the king, but we're gonna be defined. Let me ask the panel who has any uh, advice on how that development is gonna be get us to the... Yeah, so one thing that's interesting is that some, we can talk about AI and machine learning as, as a vertical opportunity, but it's also, uh, a nice horizontal technology. So a company like Cadence, who develops design tools, we're developing within our algorithms machine learning capabilities that make our software better. And so it's a recursive thing that as these algorithms and things get optimized for different purposes, it, it expands the, the capability of our tool. And you know maybe your company can can find applications where the combination of hardware and software gives you a system play, and that, that could grow your, your uh, available market. Uh, I worked for Intel for a very long time, and companies like Intel, Broadcom, Qualcomm, they all did very well when the concept was that you have a few killer chips. On killer chips, you can spend 100 million to a billion dollars, develop them, and you can make millions and millions of copies and sell them. That's the entire business model. The business model actually starts to fail as the interaction between the computers starts moving towards the edge. And as you start interacting with the edge, the same killer chip actually doesn't work. Just look at mm -hmm. sensors in cars. How many different sensors are needed? Sensors at home, how many different sensors are needed? And they're all slightly different. They're not exactly the same. So you cannot just make one killer chip to solve these problems. So I think that as the world is going to move more and more towards the edge, the number of computing platforms, the number of chips that are needed is actually going to explode. And there is no fixed formula that I can have to sit here and I can tell you, okay, for this segment, do all these chips that way. In fact, it is my opinion that the number of design starts and the number of chips are going to multiply much more than what we have today. This explains why we have 1600 uh, companies in China, why I think that there will be more than 3,000 in five years. So I think that is going to happen. So software is always going to remain very important and I think AI and all those things will extract data and, and analyze the data and, and make use of the data, but we need to get the data. And in, that, in order to get the data, we need to interact uh, with, with the environment, which is very unpredictable and is very different. And, and so I see a very bright future in that sense 
for all kinds of uh, hardware companies which are going to develop either edge related or those uh, chips which are workload related just like what wave computing is doing. The workload is very important and is changing and they have to develop many many different versions because workloads are not predictable. Uh, as, and can I say a, 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 some statement I really want to make about China and I think what China will play a big role in semiconductor, is that okay? I will have 30 minutes for each of you to make one statement. Okay, I will use that. For that question, I think Felita from the area. I certainly would like to uh, talk about that. So one of the reasons we made our uh, processor fabric reconfigurable, uh, and we, we actually made it software definable. And in fact, the name of the project, and the internal name of the project, back when we were getting early funding, was software defined ASIC. Software defined ASIC is actually the uh, what we see is the opportunity going forward, primarily because it's so damn expensive to get to, to spin a chip that uh, you you know in, a, in order for a small group of people to be able to innovate in a very deep submicron way, they need a mechanism for creating it really quickly and low and, and, and with low cost. They also need a mechanism for once it's developed to make it very programmable, and so that's why we we believe that. Computational efficiency with software programmability is a really important area going forward for the semiconductor industry. Any more comments on software defined semiconductor? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think uh, I'm going to close up here in the interest of time. I will have uh, each of you to give a 30 second statement, whatever point you want to make, and back up with their reasoning. Maybe uh, start with Luke. Um, I will just uh, emphasize the title of my talk, um, The Future is the Convergence of IoT, AI, and Blockchain, and uh, includes the ADAS, obviously. Um, I, I think autonomous driving is coming, and there are 6.3 million cars produced every year in U.S. and 80 million in total globally, and that's a big market. Right now, we need the semiconductor industry to work together with us. We really need you. So for me, it's uh, this is my first Casper meeting, and it's been a real joy to be here and uh, to meet people. And uh, this is a thrilling and, uh, environment and a thrilling and innovative group of people. So um, I would uh, like to attend more of these. Uh, very <laughs> much. Uh, it's been very fun. Uh, I would uh, shamelessly like to plug, if there are people out there that have looked at the architecture of the TPU and think they can do better, please contact me. <laughs> I will take more than 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so I, actually I wanted to say something which is very relevant to this crowd here. Uh, I work in a couple of charities, I go around the world and I've been doing that for 25 years. But you know what, you used to go to poor countries and you used to see a lot of young kids, little kids running around with no clothes, no shoes and that was very common. But if you go to some of the poorest countries around the world today, that doesn't happen anymore. Those poor people have clothes, have shoes. And you know why they have clothes and shoes? The clothes of one country, China. China has made it possible for the world poorest to be clothed and actually have shoes. I believe same China is going to give them cell phones, connectivity, and opportunity. Why? Because we were able in China to do things at such massive scale that it became affordable for the poorest of the poorest. I, as I'm growing older, am becoming very, very concerned about equity in the world. It is no longer important to me that how good education my daughter gets but it is also important for me that every child in the world has to be treated as my child. And that's not the case today. I think that while many other countries progressed, they did well for their, and China did too. But in doing so, China did a lot of good to the world. I think 
China is going to do a lot good to the other 1-2 billion people that is working on World Belt One Road project. And I see very positive sign that semiconductors can play its role so that we can bring cell phones, tablets and other things that you know we can bring to the poorest of the poor and whatever role I or my company or anybody I can influence can do, I'll do my till I die. I would like to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would just say that the, the future is uh, really bright for silicon and silicon successors, whatever those technologies may be, that all of the world's challenges and problems and opportunities can be uh, addressed and made better through the, the innovation that comes from, from groups like this and the collective application of, of such amazing technology into areas where it does some social good. So um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's exciting to be part of this and it's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to first of all echo what uh, Ravi just said about China. Uh, I, I think this is, this is true that uh, uh, with the progress that China has made in the last, uh, let's say, 30 years, uh, it has made everything you know, available or accessible to many, many uh, poor countries. So we hope this will continue. What I mean is the, this globalization, right? this collaboration between different regions. So I think this is a better uh, you know, model than trying to uh, just do, do things in your own, uh, own region or try to block people out. Uh, also, I, I believe you know the theme is semiconductor. As we we've seen all these uh, panelists and uh, in my talk as well, whether you're in hardware, you're in software, or you're in semiconductor, right? There, there's a future, but especially people who are already in semiconductor, right? This is a very exciting time. This is a very interesting time. The future is bright, right? The industry still continues to grow. There's lots of opportunities. And you see uh, Chris you know, trying to recruit people, right? Right here. <laughs> right? So there's a shortage of talent, so that means this is you, are, you are in the right industry. Right? So if you're in the hardware business, you want to try to do software, I do think you should think about I mean, your management, where's your core competency? Right? If you do well in hardware, there's a future, right? If you think software is the way to go, you, have, you better think about all these other people doing software. How do you compete with them, right? So that's uh, just my, my key message. Also, finally, I want to say thank you to uh, Brendan and the whole yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, our moderator, Connie, and also uh, Richard is the guy who organizes the whole event. Maybe you should say that. <laughs> but anyway, this is a great collaboration between Caspa and Sammy. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Let's give another round of applause for all the wonderful panelists. Thank you.